My guest today is Andrew McKenna. Andrew, welcome to the show. Pleasure, Dean. Thank you. You've got my attention. From federal <laughs> prosecutor to federal inmate. Yes. I got to hear this one. Let's go back to the beginning. Sure. Um, tell me how it was growing up. Well, I grew up here in Schenectady, and, um, you know, by all means, I had a fairly normal childhood. There weren't any real, like, abuse issues mm -hmm. or trauma issues. Um, the youngest of four, um, my parents were together, and, um, but I noticed at a very young age that I never really felt completely comfortable in my own skin. And, you know, fear, anxiety, um, depression, although we weren't really identifying depression as much then. Mm. Um, but I kind of kept it to myself and, um, you know, acted out in minor ways as a kid. But I noticed that around 12, 13, 14, that anxiety that I had in middle school going into high school um, would go away if I drank a little bit of beer or Jack Daniels and, you know, smoked some weed. And so those feelings would go away. The, the, the pitfall there is I never learned those coping skills that you have to learn to realize what's going on in your head isn't necessarily true. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of negative self-talk. And the odd thing was outwardly, as I said, I mean, I was an athlete. I did well in school. I had so good grades. Played sports. Grades were okay. They weren't great. You know, I was kind of bored by school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I probably would have benefited from like a Montessori type environment. Um, public schools, very good schools. Zoller, Oneida, Linton. Um, but yeah, outwardly, I was you know I was somewhat popular. I had plenty of friends, so I should have been fine. But inside my head, I wasn't super fine. So. You know, not developing those coping skills, taking that into my 20s now and, you know, leaving school in the 11th grade, um, joining the military, getting my GED, um, you know, stationed out in Hawaii. What branch of service? Uh, first the Air Force and later I went into the Marines as an officer. Well, thank you for your service. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for saying that. Um, but I was living a life out and I was out in, stationed out in Hawaii, you know, 18 year old kid. I mean, you know, there weren't. We weren't doing drugs because we were getting drug tested, right. you know, <laughs> but we could drink as much as we That'll wanted. That'll stop people from doing drugs. We'll just drug test everybody. <laughs> right, right. And if you, if you fail, you're going to the brig, you know, yeah. you're going to jail. So, um, but certainly booze was cheap, mm -hmm. you know, on military bases, I'm sure it's still the case. I mean, it was half of what it would cost out on the, on the uh, civilian side. Um, but again, I did well in the Air Force. I did one tour. Decided to move on. I went to school, um, got my undergraduate, moved back here uh, to the Albany area, finished up at SUNY, um, you know, political science, minor in psychology. Um, and my friends who are engineers joke with me that I took the easy way out with political science. And, um, but that's what I was interested in. And then a big change occurred in my life. So I graduate college and I don't know what to do with my life. And so my oldest brother, who um, had graduated a couple of years earlier from Albany Law School, he said, well, if you go to law school, you're locked in for three years. You don't have to think about your life. You know, you have your plan. <laughs> and uh, that was perfect for my mind because I didn't want to have to think of and worry and we'll, have anxiety. We'll follow up in three years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll revisit this in three years. And um, sure enough, three years goes by and I'm, I'm partying in law school, but, you know, not, not super, super hard. I would never went on any kind of, like, runs, you know. Right. Um, did fairly well. And, but at the end of the three years, I'm like, well, now what am I going to do? So I talked to my oldest brother again. <laughs> and my first older brother, not an attorney, but just a brilliant guy and always gives great life advice. They both really do. And my sister as well. Um, he says, well, why don't you join the Marines? I'm like, join the Marines? He said, yeah. I said, he, I said I, you know, this one-star general, retired. He could talk to you about it. Um, and sure enough, I met, met uh, with uh, General King, um, who happened to be formerly the, the highest-ranking lawyer in the Marine Corps. Wow. Yeah, and this was around like the time, like that, um, what was that Tom Cruise movie where Nicholson says you can't handle the truth, whatever that movie was. A Few Good Men. A Few Good right. Men. So it's right around that time. So now I'm intrigued. I'm like, wow, oh. this is, you know, this is kind of you cool. might end up in like, a movie. Yeah, like Tom Cruise, you know, or Kevin Bacon. 
<laughs> and um, <laughs> that's how fickle my brain is. You know, I see that and it's like glittery. So, um, but I looked into it and the, and the fact was that I would get trial work immediately. And that was really what I wanted to be was a, a good trial attorney. Right. Um, so I joined, I joined the uh, Marine Corps as an mm -hmm. officer. Best time of my life. You know, the training itself was amazing. Um, officer candidate school down at Quantico, 10 weeks, just grueling uh, physically, but also mentally, because they're trying to weed out people that can't lead. Right. And so what they'll do is they'll give you like 15 tasks. You're in charge, McKenna. You know, and they'll sit there with a clipboard. And as soon as you start to get a handle on things, they'll give you more stuff. So we had a huge washout rate of almost like 40%. Um, by the grace of God, I made it through it. You know, I just stayed off people's radar for the most part. It's been the story of my life until. And, um, but I got trial work. I left the Marine Corps after a tour and got my dream job with the Justice Department as a prosecutor. Wow. And, um, you know, young guys from Albany, New York, typically don't get picked up by the Justice Department. So I was very fortunate. Uh, you know, it's all Harvard, Yale, Duke, wow. Chicago. It's, yeah, they, you know, well, they're, Coveted jobs, you know, great work if you can get it kind of thing. Um, but I perform well and I work super, super hard. Uh, I probably had to work harder than the next guy because, you know, they're just naturally smart or I don't know what it was. Um, great experience, you know. Now, just going back a little ways, you know, where did my addiction start? Well, we know it started when I was a kid. Um, and I kind of carried that through into my adulthood. Um, again, searching for that escape, that no feel, no deal. Mm. And um, I had hurt my back in the Marine Corps during training exercise. I know where this is heading. You know it. And it's, it's textbook, right? Yep. And it's just my friend who sees me speaking, you know, across the country. He said, this is the perfect storm for you. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this timing for you yeah. to come in and try to, you know, spread the message of, you know, experience and strength and hope. You know, this is so anyhow. Um, I grin and bear it for a couple of years in the Marine Corps because a broken Marine, they're going to send you home. Oh, yeah. You know, um, and I always say that I understand that and it's mission first and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, now we have 66,000 veterans that are opioid dependent mm. or addicted. Um, but back then you weren't getting anything. So um, I grin and bear it. And you know what, Dean? I treat it exactly how it should have been. Heating pads, ice packs, over-the-counter Motrin. You know, I had a little L4, L5 shake up in the back. I get out, and when I get to the Justice Department, I go to a doctor in Washington, D.C., where I lived and worked. And um, he's intrigued by my job because I'm traveling the country and all over the place prosecuting these drug cases in cartels and money laundering, uh, you know, ironically enough. <laughs> but he's intrigued by it, you know. And so um, I go in, I put on weight, you know, traveling, eating hotel foods, you know how it is. And my back started to act up. Now, I should have treated it with Motrin, heating pads, and ice packs. Mm -hmm. But I went to the doctor, and he prescribed me 100 Percocet. Have I got something for you? 10 milligrams. We got to treat the pain. You know, that's what he said. No MRI, no X-ray, no... I, I don't even think there was, like, a physical exam. But he wasn't, like, a pill mill doctor. Mm -hmm. He was a legitimate doctor. Um, but I think he came up in a time where... Big Pharma was convincing doctors that these things weren't really, right. uh, you know, addictive, which is nonsense. But they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars convic convincing doctors that they're okay, that fewer than 2% of their patients are going to become addicted. And we just know that's not the case. So immediately, and you know, in your treatment um, facilities, opioids, you know, it's the no field, no deal drug. Yep. So it's the perfect thing to shut down what's going up here. Um, those we'll, take, we'll take care of your back. And your head. That's it. You know, and so it was it was the perfect fit for me and the absolute worst fit for me. Mm. You know, so I start taking those not as directed. You know, I'm traveling all over. I'll get back to D.C., call my doctor. Oh, I left my script in California or left my script in Chicago. No problem, Andrew. I'll send you in a new one. You can go pick it up in a few minutes here. Sure enough, I just kept, you know. So that was Percocet, oxycodone. Um I end up leaving the Justice Department, uh, and I write about this in my book, Sheer Madness, um, under not good terms, okay? Uh, there was some misconduct on my part, um, and just, I kind of could have compromised a massive investigation uh, based on something that I did, and um, 
they said, you got to go, mm. you know, there was really no real offer of treatment. You know, it was just like, look, why don't you just go quietly off into the sunset? Um, so I moved up to New York, married with two little kids at the time, uh, three and two, or maybe two and one and a half at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, nice little house in Del Mar, got a good job at a good firm in Albany and, you know, call around, find, trying to find a doctor to prescribe Percocet and they just put up roadblocks, Yeah, you know, um, New York had gotten out ahead of this, at least we thought, um, to limit prescribing. And, um, I mean, I had doctors hang up on me. I had doctors say, don't call here anymore. You know, I'm not, you know, like I, one guy gave me 10 hydrocodone or something. And so I called for a refill because you're not getting a refill. Mm. Um, so really hard line stuff. And this is Percocet. So it's oxycodone. So when I would run out, the withdrawal symptoms are, you know, they're pretty bad. You feel like you have a cold. You yep. feel crappy for like, you know, a couple of days, but you can get through it, you know. Um, but when the Percocet ran out and I couldn't find a doctor up here, I called an old friend. And he said the magic words. He said, well, I can get um, OxyContin. Oh, our friends from Purdue. Purdue Pharma, right. And so I was on Fox and Friends um, not too long ago debating uh, Dr. Keith Ablow. The FDA, mm -hmm. remember, they had proved mm -hmm. sending 12-year-olds home with the bottles. What not could th happen? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and it, it was funny because Keith Ablow, he's a psychiatrist, and he really attacked me on the on the little de, you know six minute debate we had on a Sunday morning, and um, he said, well, "Well, Attorney McKenna, he said, isn't it true that you committed crimes by buying heroin?" And it was almost like the perfect moment because I was able to say, "Yeah, Doc, I wrote a book about it. I'm not trying to hide it." You know, so it was like a shameless plug, yeah, and and it had some relevance. Um, but anyway, so my friend, I know. At the time, I knew of OxyContin. Uh, it was called an offensive term, hillbilly heroin. Yeah. Because you remember Appalachia. Yep, yep. West Virginia, they were crushing it when, when uh, Purdue first put it on the market, injecting it and dying. They right? had the whole OxyContin Express. Exactly. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, and so immediately I'm intrigued and a little bit nervous because I know how powerful this stuff can be. And um, I end up starting taking 80 milligram OxyContin, you know, with... with my ontology, I ended up taking like four or five a day um, of the big 80s. You know, I'm working a good job. I'm performing still at a pretty high level. Sounds like you're functional. I was functional. And um, unfortunately for us in long-term recovery, we understand that that's just an illusion, right? <laughs> it's a house of cards. Yep. And it's coming down. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's just, it's just somebody sitting there with a stopwatch just watching. Was the old not yet. Yeah, exactly. And so... Um, the Oxycontin's run out and his dealer got pinched or whatever. And so I remember this distinctly to this day. I was sitting in my law office in Albany and my stomach started flipping and I started sweating profusely, super, super nauseous. Uh, body started tightening up and it came on fast, Dean. And I kind of went into a panic. And so I knew I hadn't taken an Oxy in like a day and a half, never had experienced withdrawals before. So um, called my friend, and he says, well, there is something that I can get for you. And there was a long pause on the phone, and we went back and forth. And I knew that we both probably used our last oxy right around the same time. And he wasn't really nervous, or he wasn't really going through withdrawals. Um, anyhow, long story short, I start doing heroin. Because OxyContin, to me, is heroin in a pill. Mm. And um, once the oxys ran out. As I said, I turned to heroin and then forget it. The house of cards came down, uh, became despondent, uh, lost custody of my children, repeated losses in, in family court. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, couldn't even see my children, became so despondent and depressed. I checked myself into the psychiatric ward at Albany Med. Um, number one, I had nowhere to go. I'd burned enough bridges where nobody was going to allow me into their house. Uh, and, you know, to protect themselves and their belongings. And, you know, they were fed up. Family was fed up. And mm -hmm. you know how that, that's part of the disease. Um, and it's, it's interesting looking back now after a lot of therapy and a lot of, I, I was at Conifer and Troy outpatient, Lisa Beckett and those folks pretty much saved my life. Mm. Um, 
But before I got there, I ended up uh, going on a crime spree and um, had lost my job, as I said, driving up to family court one day and I drive north and I go to Lake George and I rob a bank. I go in. Hold on. Yeah. So you go from federal prosecutor. Right. To heroin addict. Yeah. To bank robber. Yes. Yes. I knew, even though I'd put some clean time together, it wasn't going to be enough for the judge. Right. I relapsed. I used. Um, and going to court, I knew I had to take a urine screen. Um, you know, and back then, I blamed everybody but myself. Oh, of course. It's you somebody know. else's fault. Right. It's the judge's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. Yep. It's the system's fault. It's everybody's fault. You know, now, clearly... I realized that I'm responsible. Addicted people or people in long-term recovery, we're responsible for our actions. Now, I understand the compulsion stage of addiction sure. where you kind of lose your free will, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's not a moral failing. You know, it's just the chemical changes in your brain and your body, and it's a disease. Um, so instead of going to family court, I drove north and, and robbed the bank. And then in the next six or seven weeks, I robbed five more, a um, couple of grocery stores, I mean, I was just, you know, wow. I was off the charts, you know. Was that the bottom? Um, that was, that led to the bottom of having to look at my girlfriend's face when she came to Albany County Jail after my arrest. Um, it was right after uh, we didn't even try to do a, a bail hearing. You know, clearly bank robbers don't get bail. Um, <laughs> I mean, we tried. I but um, so I sat in Albany County Jail. So the bottom was having to see the look of disappointment on her face. Yeah. Um, so I'm in Albany County Jail. I'm like, wow, I got to get out of here. <laughs> you know, this is terrible. You know, and this is I think it was probably prior to um, Sheriff Craig Apple taking mm -hmm. over the jail. Mm -hmm. And it was just in my view, it was a hellhole. Now, jail's not supposed to be a fun place anyhow. But I literally withdrew for seven or eight days mm -hmm. on the floor of the medical unit. You know, no comfort meds like we use at, at our treatment facilities if necessary. Yeah. You know, no Suboxone, no Methadone, nothing, right? So during that seven-day period, that was hell, you know, where I'm throwing up, I'm defecating, urinating, you know, falling asleep, waking up, you know, really wanting to die at that point because it was just the withdrawals were so vicious. Um, and, of course, I was, I was at that point, I was probably using... I don't know, 60 or 70 bags um, of heroin a day. Wow. Yeah. I mean, my, my habit was, was high, you know, for sure. Um, but anyways, they put me in general population, and I, um, I keep calling my attorney, Gene Promomo, who's a great criminal defense attorney, works at the Federal Defender's Office in Albany. Um, and he's like, look, we got to get bail. we got to figure this out. And he goes, you're not really going to get bail, but if you want to try, I will continue to try. So we went back to Judge Randolph Therese, who was a magistrate uh, judge in federal court in Albany. But this time we went back with a plan. I had seven, six or seven months clean in the jail, um, you know, serving that time. You know, you know, the federal case was pending still. We hadn't pled. So anyhow, I get an appointment with Conifer. Um, funny conversation from my counselor's office at the jail with Lisa Beckett, who was the leader mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Conifer. And um, the conversation went something like, she says, well, you're, you're in jail, but you're calling for me to do an assessment. You want to come to the office and do an assessment. And of course, she's thinking, this guy's not getting bail, right? And it's been in the newspapers and on the news. So some people um, in our field were following it, I'm sure. Um, so she says something to the effect like, well, I'll pencil you in, you know, as if you're really going to get bail. But then I had, you know, I got together with a, a psychologist. She wrote an evaluation, a report to the court. I arranged uh, through family um, and uh, my love Dawn was instrumental in arranging for the ankle bracelet, mm. ankle monitoring and all these things. A little cash bail package we put together and Judge Trees gave me uh, bail and I got out. And um, I started immediately at Conifer uh, in their intensive outpatient program, probably four groups a day, or a day, four groups a week, an individual a week. Um, and it was my chance to embrace recovery because at that point, I just didn't want to go back. 
Right. You know, um, ultimately, I end up doing 65 months in federal prison. That was my sentence. Um, I didn't have a weapon. Um, saw probably the most violent acts I could imagine in prison while I was there. Um, you know, there's no really such thing as club fed, you know, because if bank robbery is considered a violent crime under the statute, and so there's no going to a camp where you have freedom, you know, you're going to legitimate prison. Um, but while I was there, I journaled, and this is what I recommend to clients mm. that I get into treatment all the time. Um, start journaling, you know, get these thoughts out of your head. Um, a lot of these negative thoughts, most of them aren't real. And so as I'm writing this stuff and, and giving this advice, it sort of sinks into me that this, you know, I acted in a manner inconsistent with my value system. And we all have a value system. And when I'm working with clients, I say, well, all right, let's sit down and define what this is. Um, and I'm not talking law clients. I'm talking like people who are just seeking treatment. Mm -hmm. That's what I do now with addiction campuses. Um, and you know, so that journaling process that occurred in, in prison ultimately turned into a book. You know, it's not about bank robberies. It's not about crimes. It's not about any of those things. It's about my story growing up and you know falling from grace if you want to call it grace you know um as paul grondel from the times union who's now the director of the writers institute for new york state amazing job amazing writer and guy a friend of mine now he reviewed the book a couple of years ago when i when i you know brought it out and he has this great line you know heroin doesn't read resumes mm. you know and it really doesn't mm. you know um or it could apply to anything. Addiction doesn't read resumes. You know, not that I had this great high fluent resume, but you know, that, that it, it is what it is from federal prosecutor to federal inmate. Yeah. That's not a headline you see in the Times Union. Right. No, absolutely. You know, but that, that whole perception of an addicted person living under the bridge, oh, yeah. shooting you know, up dirty needles, you pushing know. a grocery cart, brown paper bag. Right. That's not, I mean, going to the bathroom on themselves. Right. And we still see that. Sure. <laughs> you know, but now, you know, now it's, it's, it's changed. Soccer mom. Soccer mom. Police you know, officer. Yep. Absolutely. And then and a lot of the people that I work with are first responders, you know, heavy trauma. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's a police officer in Massachusetts and they had, I believe he had to Narcan somebody six times in, in one episode of an overdose just to bring him back. And I think the kid was like 17. Wow. You know, which is, you know, the population that you help. Yep. Um, well, Andrew, I, and I think, and I've come to the conclusion, and I think sometimes, you know, um, people outside of our field are, are a little disconnected, sometimes more so than others. And I've just started explaining it. And, and as a person in long-term recovery myself, personally and professionally, I do believe that behind every use is pain. Now, it could be physical pain if we're talking about opiates yeah. or trauma. Yeah. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Yep. You know, no one, no one says, hey, when I grow up, I want to be an addict. That's right. Hey, I'm, I'm going to law school. Maybe someday I'll go to federal prison. Yeah. No, that's exactly That'd right. That'd make a great book. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just got to get through it. <laughs> I heard it's a pretty good book. Yeah. Um, that's absolutely spot on. You know, that's... You know, and as I explained to different people, um, you know, this isn't a moral failing, you know. We're responsible as addicted people to seek help. And when I talk to schools and, and different organizations and corporations across the country, I tell them, I say, look at your, what your, how you're living your life. If you have an issue, ask for help. Yeah. You know, I work with a lot of lawyers. Well, they don't want to leave their firm to go to a 30-day or 60-day residential plan program. Right. Well, what's the consequence of if you don't go, you know, and then there's all sorts of protections now for people who are suffering from addictions where they're allowed to go to treatment. Right. And they can't be terminated for it. You know, certain circumstances, moral turpitude. Andrew, on another side, um, can we talk about as a and I'm kind of putting you on the spot as a former federal prosecutor? Can we talk about the way criminal justice um, addresses substance use disorders? Absolutely. And um Fortunately, when we talk about alternatives to incarceration for the addicted, mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to see a sea change. I work with judges and district attorneys, and you know I know that you get involved as well. But um, 
it doesn't make any make any sense to just warehouse an addicted person in any sort of environment without giving them treatment. Yeah. Right. And if you're a conservative, then you say, well, this person got themselves into the problem in the first place. Well, if you're, you know, if if you're fiscally conservative, then just think of what we're spending as taxpayers. It's a revolving door. So that's the, the counter argument. $65,000 a year yeah. per inmate. Yeah. Right. We need recidivism more than... rate of 65% and yeah. 45 in the state. We need help, not handcuffs. Exactly. So I was very encouraged this morning. I spoke to a graduating class of a drug court in Albany, mm -hmm. uh, Jug, uh, Judge Connolly's court, um, 35 graduating members. That's great. Yeah. Between seven months and 20 months of clean time. Wow. And you just look at their eyes and they're, they're just, they're cleaned up. They're feeling better about themselves. And it's probably the happy, one of the happiest days of their lives not to be in a drug court system anymore because it's rigorous. <laughs> yeah, you know? it's not easy. No, but it gives people the opportunity to embrace recovery uh, as opposed to just going and sitting in a jail cell, you know, three hots and a cot. So um, I am encouraged by that. We need to see more of it. Uh, I think, you know, judges and district attorneys, you know, especially with district attorneys, this isn't about wins and losses. This mm. isn't W's and L's. You know, I learned that as a prosecutor with the Justice Department. You know, you have to come at it with a sense of judgment, a sense of justice. Um, and ultimately, it gives that addicted person the opportunity to um, embrace recovery and then pass it on. You know yeah. that yeah. being in the field and being in recovery yourself. So now you're like, it's, just, it's like this butterfly effect. You help one guy uh, or one gal, and then they're going to pass it on, whether it's a 12-step program or, you know, uh, some other type of recovery program, but it's encouraging. I'm encouraged by yeah. it. Yeah. So Sheer Madness. Yes. How can somebody get that book? Um, Barnesandnoble.com and also um, Amazon.com and they can order it. And um, I do book signings and I typically bring books with me when I do my speaking engagements. Uh, and so I'm happy to sign books. And how can somebody reach out to you personally? Well, for me, my, I'll give you my phone number. Okay. And it's my direct line. So if somebody needs to get into treatment or has a loved one, call 518-269-8306. And I'll work directly with families. I get people placed with insurance, without insurance. Great. And it's addiction campuses. It's, it's premier treatment. And, you know, nobody has to take a second mortgage out. You know, we're not, we're not in the industry to make money. We're in the industry to help people. Andrew, thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure, Dean.